Yes, maybe what you need to know about me is that um, yeah, yeah. I'm the author of 11 novels and quite a lot of non-fiction scripts, um, no poetry. Um, I, I was as nervous reading out my work in that last workshop as some of you would have been. However, I am going to ask you, if you're brave, to do a little bit of reading out of me today. So um, we're going to look at how to build character voice in a piece of fiction or even non-fiction, it's the same thing. What we're trying to do is devise a way of making a character sound like a real individual person. But the weird thing is that it's really interrelated with everything else that you do in writing. So when you're thinking about writing a story, you've got your character in the middle and all of these things that come off it the plot, what happens in the story, who that person was and the story behind the story, um, what the story is really about, which is what I, I call theme, and then the language of the story, all these things get thought about 
kind of in tandem in order to make a story feel really layered and really real. Um, and I guess that people tackle writing a big piece of writing in different ways. My um, background is that I've taught novel writing for um, 10 years, so I've watched a number of people go through the novel writing process. And um, it seems to me that if you do this big thinking stuff before you start writing, it does make it easier to get a story that actually holds together as you move forwards. So it's a way of thinking about story that is totally coming from the character. And in this case, we're looking at a main character. So the voice is the thing that's inseparable from everything else. Um, and the story structure is what holds it together and gives us the forward momentum of the story. I'm just going to go over this stuff quickly. And I'm going to draw you on a little picture, which hopefully will make sense. Um, Chris, who was a student of mine a long time ago, will be very bored by this. Sorry, Chris. I won't be bored at all. So, so oh, to me, this is, this is the basic thinking of any story, and non-fiction story as well. So say you were writing a memoir, it's, always, it's also a really useful way to think about story. So to me, I'm really focused, um, a story structure looks like that. So it looks like a mountain, and that's because we are taking a character on a journey. So this is the structural thinking. You might only be writing this much of the actual story that you're thinking about. This might be your short story. But in order to do that with a real authentic feel to it, you have to have done the whole thinking journey. And basically what that is, is that we start the character at the beginning of this journey. And we have to figure out who this person is. It's just, just like every one of you who's come here today, I can take you at face value and get to know you. But you are the sum of everything that you've experienced up until this point. So when you're thinking about character, even though this might be the starting point of the story, you as the writer have to know everything about them, even from before birth. So who were their parents? Where were they born? A, char a character that's born in the middle of um, sub-Saharan Africa is going to have a very different picture of life to somebody born in um, central New York. Somebody born 100 years ago has a different view on life than somebody born now. So all those things impact who this person is at the start of the story. And one of the main things that's really useful to know is what their values are. Because the values really sit under the voice of the character. So who is this person? What do they believe? Because those core beliefs are actually the things that are being um, pressurized as the story goes on. Because not only are they on a journey, they're on an upward journey. And that means that we're squeezing them a bit as the story goes along. And out of that squeezing, they discover things about themselves so that by the end of the story, that character has changed in some way. This is to represent change. Um, that they are no longer this person. They have become this person. And so then we think about it backwards. And we say, well, if they're this person here now, we know that logically, change, actual long-term change comes over the course of experiences. It's very rarely that somebody's just cruising along and has a major epiphany and goes off in a different direction and, and changes. It's usually the result of pressures along the way. And so in thinking about what those pressures are and their kind of logical progression, they are what bring us to this person here. And so this is our ordinary world where we start. This becomes the new ordinary world here. And that is really story structure in five minutes. That is how you do the thinking of, it, of an actual novel. Um, I'm just going to pass that. So um, Joseph Campbell, who did a lot of work on story structure um, probably 30 or 40 years ago now, and he's, you may have heard of the um, talk of the hero's journey, which is one of the, one of the kind of structural devices that people use in order to think about storytelling. What he did was he went around the world and he collected all the kind of myths and legends of all the different um, cultures 
and he analyzed them and he discovered that they all had a pattern, which was basically this pattern, which is unsurprising really because most stories are about people reaching for their true identity, which is really what we're doing as human beings. So in fact, we're telling stories that reflect what we're doing in real life, which is important. Um, but the really, really interesting thing that he did was not the outward kind of plot points, which he did also talk about. So you've got ordinary world crossing the threshold. These are all kind of mythic archetypes. Um, seizing the sword, um, <coughs> grabbing the elixir. These were the kind of mythic structural outer stories he identified. But the really, really great part was that he then identified it in terms of psychology. And so what the psychology shows us actually is how somebody goes from one state of being and believing to another state of being and believing. So you can't do it all in one go. So you don't know very much about what's going on. You start to get an idea and realize that maybe you have to make some change, but you don't really want to. So you can put this into any um, kind of um, example. So I could say, this is certainly how I gave up smoking. I knew that it wasn't a good thing to do. I knew that I had to stop. I really didn't want to. I said I would, but actually I kept kind of having these um, relapses until finally it came to the point where this is it. I actually knew in my heart this was the thing I had to do, and at that point you master it. But you could put that into any kind of change that you're doing. And so this is a great way of thinking about the steps along the way in terms of the emotional journey of a character. <coughs> now this part here is vital because this is the part, you know when you're learning something and you've kind of embodied it, you, want, you know all the words, you know all the jargon, you know how you should be, and you're tested on it but you fail because it's not actually coming from your heart. And so this is that moment. So you've embodied it kind of outwardly, <coughs> but when you really test it, there's still resistance. And so this becomes that dark night of the soul moment. Um, so if you thought of this as a relationship that was falling to pieces or something, this would be the bit where you've tried, 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 this was where you're gonna actually do something, but it fails. And this is that moment where you sit there, I cannot live like this anymore, this is not who I am. I would rather be on my own than continue like this. It's that kind of moment. So it's the inward looking moment. And that's the moment, this one here, where you finally make that change that is gonna carry you forward. And then you can actually go into your new normal and carry on in that new way. So each of these is like its own little mini climax as you're faced with a new challenge. And you can't have had this one unless you had this one. And you can't have had this one unless you've had this one because it's an actual growth that you're going through. It's not just a length for no reason. Does that make sense? Are there any questions about that? Does that make sense to you? Okay, so it's important to remember that because what we're looking at to form the voice of a character comes from this moment. And we're going to focus on that. So it's the values. It's the obsessions that we've got. So if you were a writer, you, you have obsessions like sitting in cafes and eavesdropping on people's conversations. Or you, you know, you're fascinated and you go and visit somebody and you're just standing there looking at what's on their bookshelf. You're always kind of observing these things. That is our obsession in the way that we focus and function in the world. So everybody has these. Um, somebody who is a painter might notice colours and shapes more than somebody who isn't. If you're very musical, you might process the world differently. These are the things that are really useful to us as a writer that we need to hone in on with character. And we talk about the lens through which somebody views the world. And if you think of somebody, I've got a sister who is, we, we fondly call her the Eeyore in our family. <laughs> so, you know, she is definitely a half glass, half empty person. So you could say to her, 
gosh, isn't it a beautiful day? And she'll say, it's going to rain later. You know, that kind of thing. So that's the lens through which she sees the world. And that's a great, that's very useful when you're trying to form character and to give them a, um, a really distinct voice. So this is an example of a, writer, a New Zealand writer called Tracy Slaughter. She is a real expert at voice. So let's just have a look at this. And what I want you to do, I'll read it out at the same time. I want you to think about the words in here that really tell you some, something about this character who is narrating this. Then bitch is yours. The boy stares at the bloke behind the service station counter. There's a bird shape of breast wiped up the guy's boob, a dry and crow of thumbprints over the car logo. The bloke gives a hoot, you can hear snot and tar in him, twitches his head out the shop window. Them over there in the car park, them bitches carrying on. The guy stops to belch, then jolts his head again. They got something to do with you? The front of the shop glass, the shop is glass, dirt frosted. Through the grit, Jeremy sees the shapes of his mother and stepmother. Fumes rise from the metal stems that customers slot into their car tanks. The women are distant and heat bent, but everyone can see the scrap. Movements that are jokes of rage, squawking elbows, high heels stabbing the tarmac. Christ, a chick bite! Pitchy, hiss little bits of their voices drift across the forecourt. The boy sees people shrug, cough out chuckles or scorn, hunch back over their filling wagons. <laughs> It's a very distinct voice. So what kind of words come out of you that make that feel distinctive? Can you identify any that really kind of stand out? Or what kind of person do you think has this voice? Anyone? Chris, come on, say something. <laughs> well, it's very slang. It's very, um, you know, you're talking about the guy's boob and... and yeah. uh, well, yeah, it food and so it's, it feels to me it feels to me sort of set in the 50s or 60s it's, it's definitely well it's informal i think is what yeah. you're saying yeah. for a start so it could be that there's a, that it's era specific what else what other words really make you feel like this is a person talking rather than just a kind of newspaper report description it's like check five check five. yeah check five, yeah. exactly um Pitchy, hiss little bits, walking elbows, these really kind of sharp, direct phrases. It gives a hoot, you can hear snot and tar in. You know, it, it is very visual, but it's also got a kind of rhythm to it that's a really kind of, much as the words are punchy, you feel kind of punched by it. And so it's a very strong example of voice. And what kind of background do you think this person would have? Do you think that they would be a PhD in philosophy? But smart, <laughs> smart, but smart, observant, yeah, yeah. yeah. and kind of knowing the people around them. So you get all that from that little piece of writing. Um, this is where do you think this would be set? Yeah. Garage. Yep. Yeah, in the country, the country garage. Not the one that I said. Yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not. That's right. Um, what else? Do you think that it's does it seem specifically Kiwi? Not really. Not really? American, what do you think? In a way, it depends how you read it in your head, doesn't it? Yeah, I thought Kiwi. I mean, to me, I just hear, them bitches yours. That's very Kiwi, but it could be entirely American. So it's kind of also the sound that you develop in your head. So that's one way where you use those specific words. Now this is um, a little bit of the start of one of my books, which is a YA book. Um, first person from a young guy who was very, um, very hooked into politics and very interested in what's going on. And this book starts kind of at a, at a pace and, and has got a very fast pace all the way through. And you can kind of feel it in the rhythm and the, the pace of that, that you just, it's kind of like, blah, I'm throwing you into the story. And, that's, and that absolutely captures what that story feels like. Um, and then this is a different one. So this is set um, in, a, in an imaginary world in the future. And the young woman who is telling the story knows nothing except for one small Pacific island and the Bible. So everything that she's seeing, which is new here, she's only able to relate to 
the natural landscape as a way of trying to figure out what it is. So the lens that she's looking through is extremely limited when it comes to suddenly discovering the middle of this um, cruise ship atrium that's, that she's never seen anything like it before. So then you're making descriptions which, which you have to filter through what that person knows. So I, I couldn't say, um, you know, a sweeping staircase with, with glass sides and, you know, however it would have been described in the cruise ship booklet. I can't use those words because she would not know them. So everything has to be filtered through what that person knows or doesn't know. And, and, and the metaphors and the similes have to come from that knowledge. So what does it mean? It means that um, you need somebody who's conflicted and you want to see they're in a conflict. That is part of the values. And so while you've got this journey going on which has a story behind it, you've got this shift of values taking place. And so we want to kind of feel that on the page. It's actually that undercurrent of the story, that emotional story. You can, you can have it, it's a bit like the difference between a blockbuster movie and a, um, a more art house movie, if you like. Like a blockbuster has got lots and lots of plot and bangs and crashes, and it can tell a good story, but it might not have the kind of emotional layer. And actually, as human beings, we, we link to storytelling overall in order to discover something about human nature. And so if we miss that whole part out, we've missed half the storytelling. And we, we haven't allowed it to really deepen and become really meaningful for us. So I want to do a little writing exercise. You might have a character that you're already working on for a story. Or you might um, have one that you're thinking you would like to explore. Otherwise, just randomly think of an age, a gender, and, and there are 15 now, I believe, um, <laughs> an era, uh, and a setting, and just brainstorm and start chucking stuff 10 minutes down onto the page, and then we'll work it refined. So if you've already got a character, write down what you know already. For 10 minutes. And, and the idea with brainstorming is that no idea is a bad idea. Even if it seems absolutely bizarre, write it down. Because it might be the gem.
dig down a bit more into what you've already, you've already got there. So I imagine that some of you will have thought about these kind of things, like, you know, how many people in the family, where they were born. These are what we definitely need to know all this stuff, because the context of a story is really important. But now these bits that are in yellow, these are the bits that really help us form the voice. So what are the values that that person was raised with? Because that really comes through. When we're backed into a corner, that's the stuff that comes out of us. So what are the values? What are their attitudes and who do they come from? And by attitudes, I mean things like racism, homophobia, um, political beliefs, those kind of things. You might have an attitude that um, 
everybody that is unemployed is lazy. That's a very strong attitude. So think about who this person is and what are those core attitudes that they have towards things. This is also, are they an optimist? Are they a pessimist? Are they a catastrophist? Who, you know, how do they behave in situations? Passions is a really fantastic one, and it can be something very obscure. It might be somebody who is absolutely passionate about the life cycle of bees, but you can find a way of bringing metaphors and similes in that make that person more colourful as a result. So if you can think about something passionate that that person believes in, that really helps um, differentiate them. What are they obsessed with? We all have little obsessions about things that might be, you know, that you hate the toilet roll turned a certain way and that it drives you nuts and why is that? What are your obsessions? Because again, it's about the interesting things. Writing, writing fiction, we want people to feel real, but they're not just real, they're elevated real. So it's kind of like instead of just making a gravy, we're making a jus. We need it all kind of reduced so that it's really strong and it's just slightly hyper real. It's not, it's not just boring every day. We need to have precision about interesting things. Education plays a huge part in voice. Um, you know, what you've read in your life informs how you view the world. If you are somebody who has read a lot of um, literature or poetry, then bits of that might come into your thinking as you're, as you're talking about stuff. So these things are really important. Do they have any special abilities? And I don't necessarily mean superheroes. They might be extremely good at um, settling crying children. I don't know, but have they got something that they're really good at? <coughs> Disabilities is an interesting one. I've written dyslexic characters, which is always really interesting. What do people fear? Again, <coughs> Can you think of something surprising that adds to the story? So all these things that are in yellow, I would like you to, again, see if you can expand them out to this character that you're building. Okay, you've also written a gray describing so that's interesting. I think it really played with those two as well. What is a lepo? So I should know what it is. What is it? Is it a person? Is it a thing? Well, I think it's a different thing. Yeah, it's a thing. 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 It's a
I want you to keep thinking about that, but we'll move on. So now we're going to try and apply this into voice. So I want you to remember that if you're describing something, it's like we're doing a cyclic act. Have any of you ever seen that movie? It was a long time ago now called Being John Malkovich, oh, yes. where she sees it from inside his head. That's kind of what we're doing as writers. We're imagining ourselves into that head and looking out through the eyes. And so it's all filtered through that stuff that we've just been talking about. So I'm going to give you a little piece of writing. And I want you to inject as much of that character's attitude into what they're seeing, hearing, feeling as you can. So I want you to think of this as the kind of bones of a paragraph. You can change any of these words. That's really just a prompt to keep <coughs> going. What it has got is the ability to give you a little bit of dialogue, a little bit of internal thought, a little bit of description, and some sensory stuff. So I want you to put your character into here. You can fill the dots any way you want to, but it's kind of like a linked paragraph. But I want you to inject, inject so much attitude of that character into it that if we went round and heard everyone at the end, they would all be entirely different because they're coming from the core of that character that you are building. So if your character is artistic, then the way that they see it is going to be colour, shape, and all those patterns. If they're, if they're a, a belligerent old, old man, everything's going to annoy them, and um, they're going to be possibly thinking about what it was like in the good old days, I don't know. Whatever it is that you want, inject it in there so that it could only have been written by that one character that you're forming. So, I mean, do you mind if we move the whiteboard a little bit? Yeah, sure. sure. I see it. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So you might have imagined a story that's set in a desert, in which case it might not be cold, it might be hot. Feel free to change it around however you want to. But the thing we're going for is this really distinctive voice that has attitudes and which tells us about this character without it having to be spelled out. So that if you read it out, we can say, oh, that person is blah, blah, blah. And you've got 10 minutes, so don't panic.
right, so any questions on this? <coughs> Got to the end, go through and look at every word and say, could I make this stronger? Could I make this more definitely this person?
pipe on it. If you're done, these are two things I want you to think about. Looking at it, is it writerly? Did you put words down because you thought that they looked good because you needed to put big words for writing? Because if you did, take them out and write something gutsy. Could I tell you what this person was like before hearing that little piece? That's the big question. So look at the words and ask yourself. And if you think I could it, think about how you can make it clearer without telling me just by your word choices. Has anybody not got to the end yet? I'm going to stop you there, even if you haven't quite finished. What I would like you to do is, I know we're socially distancing, but if we could carefully, just in pairs, just read yours to another person and vice versa, and see if that person can tell you something about the character just from hearing it. So in two pairs, I think you've got you two. Um, so just see if you can tell the person what you've discovered. <laughs> she moved through the crowd she can smell the excitement of Thank you. 
Okay, has everybody had a chance to have a swap? So now we're going to tighten it up a little bit because this, this is very leading in order to get you to write in a number of ways. And there are a whole lot of phrases here that if we were going through editing, we would take out to make the writing much more immediate. Uh, can you not, can you recognise any of them that would be good, useful to take out at this point? That was a cold day. It was a cold day. Well, that's more a statement, but we could take that out. Um, but more like the things that are um, telling us something we, that we, we could be showing it. Which would make me feel. Yes, exactly. So we could take that out and just have the first thing that sprang to my mind. Actually, we don't even need that, do we? we could just have the thought and the feeling mm -hmm. and it would be much stronger. So we could also have, we don't really need that, do we? I wished would actually be fine. So this is kind of like the second tier of working on something that you go through and you say, right, I needed that stuff in order to direct me to what I wanted to write. But now I can get rid of it and just let the writing stand. What else could we take out of here? 
and not our memory? Yeah. else? You could possibly take this out, couldn't we? It could just be the action or the thought. So what I want you to do is go through what you've written. You might even be able to take that out. You might be able to take that out and just give it to us. So in fact, a whole lot of this goes. See how much you can take out and you've still got it logically working as a piece of writing. And if you're not sure, ask the person that you've been working with. Because our brains, as you, as you, as we read that, our brains are letting us know that without needing to write it, and it means that the writing is driven forward better. I do So what I would like to do is for us as a group to hear a few of those if you're brave enough, please. Because what I would really like for you to hear is how by thinking about character first and thinking about writing through the lens, you can have something that starts off the same but becomes very different because it's got that individual character coming through. So could we have a volunteer please to get us started? Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I only got halfway through that. That's fine. So this is an existing character. Yeah. It was a cold day, so cold Sarah's breath turned to mist, floating before her eyes. She watched it almost as an observer, moving her lips, playing with it. A person moved close past her, too close. She brought herself back to the moment, to the moment and moved through her breath, joined the crowd as the crowd joined others moving down the street, joining her breath to the throng that began to jostle around her joining even as she stayed apart, an island moving in the stream. She could smell the excitement, feel the tension as they moved closer to the square. Before her, a child stumbled, her mother steadying her even as she urged her forward. Sarah took a half step, aware of not bumping into the child, even if she hoped the momentum of those behind her would not run into her. Aware that all around her, a momentum had been created, pushed on by the sense of anticipation, and she felt a little nervous. The island that she was no longer so insular, no longer impervious to the river. It sprang to her mind that she was trapped, somehow. For a moment she wished it hadn't come. She pushed it aside, wasted energy, never second guess, never look back. It just Sarah, she thought. Almost imperceptibly she began to move against sides, veered towards the side of the street, 
the man looked at him sideways, and this is what I thought. Well, that's great. Very good. That, that had a very distinctive, well-rounded feel to it, like that was a person, and we were right there with her, which was fantastic. I think you could take the sprang to your mind out and just give us that thought, and that would have been yeah. more direct. But that's the only thing I could hear that I didn't think was needed. I think that was great. Thank you. Thank you. Could we have another one to hear how different it can be with a different character? Thank you. I, I really didn't get past line four. That's fine. That's very good. <laughs> it was a cold day, so cold she zipped up the old jacket, pulling the woolly sleeves back through the armholes, turning them inside out. Inside the tent of coat, cosy and warm, she pulled the sleeves even tighter and wrapped them around her body, grateful she'd stolen a triple XL. The crowd entering the ferry terminal looked like the sheep on Uncle Thomas' farm, making their way towards the sheds, ready for docking. All around her were tables groaning with deep fried food and families. That was great. I love that. The that, that, yeah. <laughs> so that, see that metaphor, I can't remember if it was a metaphor or a simile, but about Uncle Ted, was it? Yeah. yeah, I mean, that just immediately draws the picture for us and tells us about her and her background and values. So, perfect example. Thank you. Somebody else? Two very different ones. Yes, we do. I've got a man a few words, so it's easy. <laughs> Southeast Lee, 40 knots, sub Antarctic. Men in the mess, two regulars, the mate, three able bodied from the Melbourne run, sober enough. I can smell bilge water. Gulls swooped around us looking for scraps from the barrel. We had a short anchor chain. We were port to port, but I was uneasy not to have the name. I wish it'd been loaded with a second hauler. Name's Jewel. I introduced myself to the people around me. I didn't have anything else needed, so. Very good. And completely different again. And lots of specific detail that really kind of told us where we were and what that was all going on in that person's head. Could we have a couple more? You're going to have to talk really loud so everyone can hear. It was a cold day. As the crowd entered the town square, they looked like they could do with going back inside. I could smell what Food sizzling around me, but no one was buying me. Why aren't they buying me? It made me wonder why, but they could definitely use it. I wished I could give them some, but I had promised my sister I wouldn't let our money and friends with anything else. If only I could feed them well. Maybe we should get some food and pay on to the people around me. It looks as if I would have been more than my great son. Very good. Very cool. Very good. <laughs> you know, what really came through there was that character's values really mm. strongly, what they believed as a person. Now, how you could lift that even more is to go through, and where you've got words like food, you could actually specify what that food was. So when you say, I could smell the food, you could say, I could smell the hot chips and sausages or something, you know? And it, and it just, as soon as you put the detail in that's really specific, we, the reader, build it in our head and it comes alive. But you absolutely nailed the value thing. Well done. One more person. Thank you. <coughs> A cold day, so cold that I felt my long, long, long trays of water was up in my toes. As the crowd entered the school gates, the coffee beans roasting at the house next door smelled like a tasty dog. It smelled like a taste dog. Delight. Delight. Mm. Thank you very much. Yes. As soon as you said the words coffee beans, I could smell yes. them <laughs> and wanted some. That's the power of actually you know, naming things. So specific detail instead of being vague is what brings a person writing to life. So well done, short but sweet. I think we have got time for one more if somebody is keen. Yes. Yeah. 
this no okay so that's a that's a very quick how to kind of build a character and hold it all together i think the one thing i didn't talk about when i was showing you this picture is how theme ties into this which i think might be useful for you to know um, so the way that this person ends up underlines the thing that you're trying to say. So they are coming to a realization about whatever it is. So that's why all those things are interlinked. So when you're planning, if you know that, um, I'll, give you, I'll give you a specific example. So I wrote this novel, which was about, it was about date rape, but the main character, the biggest question he had, he was a very kind of scientific type of boy, it was his sister who was raped was that at the beginning of the book, his core belief was that we were all just we, products of our genes, that we behaved in the way that the gene, our genes programmed us to. So his big journey was to understand that we had, we also have this thing called free will, and that we actually are able to make a change in that if we want to. So that was his underlying journey. Um, and so knowing that, I could then kind of almost plot backwards and say, well, if that's where he has to end up, where does he have to start knowing that he's then got to incrementally reach that point? So in terms of planning, a lot of people will say to you, um, I don't know what the theme of the book is until I finish writing the first draft. And I think that's true on, on some levels, that stuff comes as you write. But I think if you understand the core kind of journey that your character goes on in terms of where they end up in their heads as a human being and their values, that really helps you shape the story. Then anything can happen, anything crazy can happen in the story, but because you've underpinned it with this human journey that we all go on, we believe it as a story. It doesn't matter how outlandish the, the kind of decoration is, because the core kind of heart value rings true to us because we are all human beings and on some level we do all operate in the same way. And so that's why figuring this out at the beginning also means that you've now got a goal, much as if you actually were climbing a mountain. You know that if you start off here and you don't know where you're going, if it's really hard to, to sustain the effort and then you get up to here and you see that there's another bloody mountain and you think I'm just give up. But if you always know that actually you're just aiming for the next tramping pass, it's not so terrifying. But also because you know that's where you're aiming, because you've thought this stuff through at the start, you actually then kind of free up your mind to do that creative um, description and world building and, and all the kind of interesting stuff of writing, the really creative stuff in the gaps between, because you don't need to plan out how to get there beforehand, you just have to know that that's where you're here. And so that way you're writing forwards with purpose and you're not getting too sidetracked, which is some, something that can happen when you haven't you know, done a lot of writing before. So just thinking about these things helps hold it together. And thinking about it in terms of values, I think is really useful. But also bringing those kind of specific details that only your character would really notice. So another exercise that I don't think we've got time for, but which would be very interesting if you wanted to continue with the character you've got. There was a book called um, Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, who's one of those kind of pop psychologists. Um, and he quoted a... Um, an experiment that somebody done in the States, and he talks about thin slicing versus thick slicing. So thick slicing is when you when you meet somebody, when you meet a character, say, that you learn everything about them from you know their their genetic tree through to when they had their you know, lost their first tooth, you know everything about this person, um, versus going into their room with a clipboard, looking around and making notes from what you observe. And what they discovered was that in a whole lot of ways, people just going in cold and just using their powers of observation told them as much about a person as knowing all this background stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you think about putting your, if you imagine where your character lives, 
and you actually walk around their house with them and you think, what would be in this house that would display who they are? Just think of your think of yourself. Actually walk around. I was I did it weirdly with my grandson the other day, he was just six. He wanted me to walk around our lounge and tell him what kind of significance every little trinket was and why I had it. And it was really useful because of course everything you have has a sentimental value, unless you're a hoarder, which again tells you something about that person. So try it, go home and walk around your bedroom, which is your private room, and think about what this actually tells somebody else about you. And then imagine up your character's bedroom and the things that you would put in it, the specific things that you would put in it, that, are, that somebody coming in cold would then be able to tell who they were as a person. Or like somebody's office is another great one. You know, do you have your qualifications up on the wall in the, you know, pride of place? Or do you have something, you know, what's going on? So these kind of details all help build characters. So when you hear people talking about showing, not telling, I could tell you that um, my father-in-law is a botanic old poo. But you could also just go into his house and sit for 20 minutes, look around and talk to him and you would pick it up in exactly the same way. And that's the difference. It's the difference between saying this is it or just presenting the evidence and allowing your reader to come to that conclusion. And so that means you trust your reader to be smart enough to get it. And you, the writer, choose the things that you know like a treasure hunt that will lead them to that conclusion. Um, I think I've probably run out of steam in terms of um, doing any more, but I'm really happy we've got about seven minutes and I'm really happy to ask, answer any questions that have occurred to you about this or any other writing thing that you're learning to know about that I can try and help with. Thank you. Could you do this about every character? Like you have to like a main, but there's often only one or two others. So yes, I would do this for all the ones that actually really matter. You know, obviously there are some for the ones that don't. Mm -hmm. But but I partly do that because I believe that you should be able to justify everything that you put into a book. So every character that you choose should be there for a purpose, so that you can say this character is here for this reason. And so sometimes. With him. So, I, so say I was talking about that book about date rape, um, the character in the middle of that was Toby and that was a very conscious decision. So I want to write a book to talk to young people about date rape. If it, who's the best person to tell this story? Now if I tell the story from the female victim's point of view, that's a very different story that is not going to connect to the readers that I want to connect mm. with, i.e. young men. So I choose the brother of the victim because I know that I've still got that emotional connection so I can still punch at the emotions. Um, so that's his sister. So here's his sister Rita. Now because the time frame of the book is quite short, um, she is what I would call a newly victimized person. So I can tell a little bit about her story through his eyes. But because this is something I really want to talk about, I can say I'm going to put another character in here that is revealed to have been raped a long time ago. So then, without having to labour the point, I can make the point that that pain doesn't go away unless it's dealt with and it becomes part of that person. So by who I choose to be characters in the story, help build, just like everything else, bring me to the things that I'm really learning to say about it. So every decision is for that reason. I'm thinking about it on a thematic level as well as how I'm going to make this story work. So yes, um, however if it's just you know the shopkeeper when they go in to buy their pie, it doesn't matter. Unless it does. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if that keeps the version of those characters. Yeah. Ah. That's a really good question. In a novel? I can't remember, but I would say overall every book that I write, I think about it and I research for at least three months and make notes mm. before I actually start writing. And I don't start writing until that character is so clear in my head that I actually can hear their voice in the way that they mm. can talk. When that happens, 
and I'm starting to write notes in the dark at night beside my bed because it's talking to me all the time. Then I know I'm pretty much ready to start. But if I don't go through that process, I end up having to go back and do it. Maybe do you ever steal characters? In a, a sense of, you've got a really good friend you know really well, you've got a sub character, I can't bother fleshing out a whole character, I'll just use Sally and, and stick her in it because I know exactly how, how she'd behave in the situation. Yeah, but you know what, usually are they the least successful mm. characters <coughs> because I've been lazy about it and I've probably kind of picked a stereotype rather than building a purpose building one. But if you use a real person, it shouldn't be a stereotype. Um, but sometimes I think you pick them because it's a shorthand or yeah, something. Yeah. So um, I think I probably did it earlier on than I do it now because mm. now I'm much more I'm much more about wanting to make them serve the story and having them there for that reason. Mm. And because I know that I've got into trouble before and I've got really <laughs> <laughs> So do you have like a dossier for each character or how do you work it? I mean, do you just have random pages of notes that are organised in some kind um, of way? I usually use school, school exercise books, so that if I'm going to start on a new project, I'll get a new exercise book and I'll just put everything I think down into there. And, and as I'm researching, because I generally research stuff around the story, um, stuff that occurs to me I'll put into there. And then when I've kind of done that, then I will sit down and do this kind of overall shape. What is the character journey? Then what are the kind of so if I know this is how they have to feel emotionally here, what is the what is the actual outward plot thing that is going to make that happen? So plan the story that way, and then do a, a really rough chapter by chapter outline. And I partly do that for the kind of logic of the story, but also because otherwise it can just feel like the story goes on forever and it's quite nice to know the size of it so that you can say I've read chapter one this week and chapter two that week. But yeah, so I do a lot of that stuff and I have um, I have research notes. Um, I have sometimes I do timelines of people's life so I know what happened to them at certain ages. That's useful for me to know. Yeah, so it can be all those things. How do you decide what your next project is going to be? Um, they're usually backed up, so <laughs> it's just like when I've got the energy to do the next one, so that's generally what it is. And, it, and at some point, I have been kind of gestating it for so long, it just feels like it's ready to go. But is there, is there, can you see the, the sort of a theme through all your different works? Like, is there something that motivates or drives you? Absolutely, yeah. Um, all my books have a kind of social justice element, so really I'm writing, quite often the starting point of something I write about is something that I'm really furious about, um, and I'm a very political person, so it's usually about abuses of power and control at some level, whether kind of political or personal. Um, so yes, often it's that kind of thing, or it's something that I want to explore. And then very, very occasionally, a, a really weird idea will just come to me and present itself and push itself forward to such an extent that I just stop what I thought I was doing and write it. And actually they have been some of the most successful ones. So you do have to trust where you kind of lead to. Yeah, I can't answer more than that so. Thank you very much for your patience. Good luck with your writing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Where are they? A lot of our kids don't. Those kids don't come down. Yes, they do. Do they? Like every week. Bella and Scarlett. Oh, they're angry. Really. But they're um, always done. Oh, 